Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 107, 107 of the Citrix Session. I'm your host, Andy Whiteside. I've got uh, got a good group of folks on from uh, internal, a little bit with Bill Sutton, uh, as well as the, the Citrix folks that have been gracious to join us uh, almost weekly on uh, on covering this podcast. He was almost almost assured that somebody uh, from the Citrix team is going to be on and has been for, for months. So, uh, Bill, Bill, how's it going? Going well, Andy. Can't complain. You know, looking forward to getting back in. To these, I've been off, you know, kind of away for the past couple of weeks for various reasons. So good to get be back. I think I was bragging about us and you guys earlier today to someone. And I think what I thought I heard you say last week on our weekly project call was that we have 7,000 hours of professional services in our uh, measurable pipeline over the next couple of months. Is that, did I make that number up or is it really, has it really built to that? Uh, it's close to that. Yeah. That's awesome. That's, that's long term, but it's uh, yeah, it's it's really healthy right now. Yeah, that's that's the dream coming to fruition, and and by dream I mean, you know, building this community and serving this community and helping people yeah. where they need help in terms of um, helping them with, with professional services in a way that aligns with their needs, not just what we're trying to force upon them. Exactly. So really proud of what we're doing there. Uh, on the Citrix side, we have our uh, our co-hosts that we have weekly, uh, Jeremy Myers and Todd Smith. Guys, how's it going? It's going right, Andy. Good to see you. Yeah, it's great. Great here up in Boston, Andy. The uh, the weather's turned around, and uh, we're we jumped right into summer up here. So, yeah, it seems to be the way it works every year these days, right? Your your spring, winter, well, your winter, little tease of summer, spring, tease of spring, and then yep. it's uh, ninety five degrees. Well, Andy, you live right up the street, so you know we went from kind of a kind of a warm winter into uh, it's it's rivaling South Florida in terms of humidity and heat right now yeah just pretty amazing i uh at this very moment i'm in southern utah uh st george it's 100 degrees today oh my but it's going to cool off here uh and it's awesome at night it's you know down in the 60s with no humidity it feels amazing um, at least they get that uh, little bit of reprieve when the sun goes down um so we've got uh, Monica Grismer with her this with us this is part three of our series on talking about the q a that came out of their uh the latest um, release uh, for Citrix DAS, which is all things encompassing these days, all the services, uh, the virtual app and desktop service spectrum, as well as the LTSR for what, uh, 2203. And I want to get to that. Um, we originally planned uh, to cover this topic, and then I tried to uh, interrupt the series and talk about the uh, Citrix and M365 announcements. Uh, you know, Jeremy Todd, I know we we talked about it coming into this, and there's not a lot to share at this point other than the fact that um, Microsoft and Citrix are going to work together to enable uh, the Microsoft DAS product, so M365, excuse me, Windows 365, um, kind of something that we all, this call, thought would have been day mm -hmm. one out of the gate, a relationship that would have been in, uh, something in existence, uh, but it sounds like Citrix and Microsoft are figuring out that the, if you want to give the world the best of that product, that's going to it's going to need to be integrated with Citrix. Anything you guys can talk about there at all? Man, I'll be honest, Andy. When I when I saw that announcement, um, the, that that blog post, and it talks about the HDX and some of the integrations there, like I was I was pretty pretty thrilled, right? And so, just like you, I had had questions, right? So, I was just as excited about you to maybe talk about that. It sounds like we're going to have to maybe hold off on the details, but um, it is a pretty um, pretty significant announcement of just a partnership with Microsoft there. So. I can't wait to dive into it. You know, I well, part of what it talked about was specifically cloud PC, right? So, you know, we talk about M365 is just a suite of all sorts of things Microsoft, but very specifically, um, you know, cloud PC. So, I think what that blog post hit on was maybe an integration of HDX. Don't know what that looks like yet. Um, is someone who spun off that cloud PC trial for? Well, I say a trial. I mean, I was paying seventy bucks a month for about six months, mm -hmm. um, just to kind of get hands on with it a little bit, and you know. You know, I would argue, um, I mean, it's a good experience for sure, right? I mean, it's a, it's a PC hosted by Microsoft in Azure, but, you know, you're, you're connecting over RDP. Um, you know, the flow to get into it was a little bit kludgy, at least from my perspective. Maybe I'm a little biased because I'm Citrix, but, you know, I think if there's an opportunity for us to kind of do what, we're, what, we, what, you know, what we've been doing with AVD and just improving that whole experience, man, I want to sink my teeth into it a little bit. So I'm looking forward to see what comes out of that here in the next, you know, few months. Yeah, so the, the Andyism I have for that one is it's like buying a forty thousand dollar car with cloth seats. You're like, oh, it'd be so much better if it just mm -hmm. had leather seats. It's close, 
but mm-hmm. man, I'm missing something that's just, you know, everyday mainstream, what people want these days, leather or some type of, you know, advanced seating technology. So I'm not dealing with old school cloth seat. Todd, do you have any take on uh, yeah, that? Announcement? I, I think, yeah, I, I think when, when we saw the announcement coming out, uh, I think it was probably yet another agreement or a partnership that we've, uh, that we've struck with, with Microsoft. I mean, if you look back at it, um, we've been partnering with Microsoft almost since the initial creation of Citrix as a company. Um, and it's just yet another continuation based on technologies that both of our companies are innovating with, right? So uh, being able to leverage what we do well and also being able to, uh, to focus on what, what Microsoft does well is, uh, you know, that's the spirit of partnership and the spirit of evolution and innovation. If I were to say it's a, it's definitely mutually beneficial, that's probably obviously true. I would say it's also uh, mutually needed, right? You, they need you to make their, you know, it's like having a cake with no icing on it. That wouldn't be so good. Uh, and you guys have great icing that you need that underlying cake. And it's, it's one without the other just seems a void. Well, when you think about it, Andy, I think this is maybe um, what Microsoft brings to the table sometimes is, you know, we talk about like that DAS market and who's going to get the slice of the pie, you know, whether it's Citrix or VMware or Microsoft, whatever, right? And I think what Microsoft brings to the table is they make the cake bigger, right? So just the whole idea of Cloud PC AVD has just really made that, that whole market bigger. And so I think it's, what's kind of exciting about the whole thing is, is just you know, the opportunity there. So I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. I think I've had that conversation four or five times this week where I say, somebody says, okay, you know, Citrix, it's, you know, going away. And then I'm like, no, you don't understand the, the, uh, the, mm-hmm. the market is growing in such a way. And then they start to question me on that. I'm like, look, my number one competitor five years ago was Microsoft, not Microsoft AVD. My number one competitor five years ago was Microsoft SCCM and their go-to-market strategy of uh, deploy and manage via SCCM. Now they're all in on virtual workloads versus they don't they, they flipped on us and they're only going to grow the they're only going to grow the the pie that we all have a piece of and then this mm-hmm. little pandemic thing showed up and people realized hey I, I probably really did need to be investigate that earlier. Mm-hmm. So Bill, uh, you want to chime in on this uh, at all and then uh, then we'll. Yeah, get I back think to, to your point, topic. I think that what you said, Andy, I think a lot of it is uh, you know if you go back a few years, like you said, around SCCM, I think the Microsoft's entry into this in a real way has really kind of validated the space um, that Citrix has been in for years. I mean, not that it was invalid, but it wasn't as common and wasn't as well respected, I guess, as it is now. And um, definitely, to Jeremy's point, it has widened widened the space, um, and folks are paying a lot more attention to all the solutions in it. And I think certainly being able to bring some of the goodness of HDX uh, to that platform uh, will help, you know, like they say, uh, what is it, a rising tide um, rises all ships or something like that. Um, I think that's what we're going to see here, I hope. Yeah. And I know uh, you and Jeremy both have said the acronym HDX, and there's lots of things that are included in that. Uh, Lots and lots of things, session recording as an example. Uh, But the number one thing, and and Jeremy hit the the three-letter acronym for the Microsoft, um, um, but HDX protocol, right? The, the thing that Citrix has been doing and evolving uh, for all these years that's still f- above and beyond uh, the most efficient, the most optimal, the most capable, the most dynamic uh, is the thing that makes it a no-brainer to add that uh, to the top of the cake. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, great. Uh, so more to come, I guess, is the takeaway from that one. As we learn more, we'll be sharing with folks. Hey, Monica, how's it going? Hello, going well. I've just been chilling here. Um, <laughs> could, could not agree more with the conversation that was just had. We're really excited about our partnership with Microsoft and just expanding upon those hyperscaler partners, right? Just making meeting customers where they are and their moves to the cloud at whatever stage that they're in. So definitely also really excited about that announcement. But hopefully we can we can chat a little bit more thoroughly on a later call. But well, I, I love that you turned our conversation around Azure, Azure Virtual Desktop, Microsoft um, uh, Desktop as a Service, Cloud PC. You turned it into a general uh, hyperscaler conversation because everything we just talked about applies no matter which hyperscaler we're talking about. Yep. And that, I mean, I think that's the beautiful thing about Citrix as well, as, as we're developing those relationships across, obviously, Microsoft 
to everyone's point, has been a huge partner of us from the jump, from the inception of Citrix, but no, there's some cool stuff happening. So excited to see what comes along in the future. I'll, I'll tell you guys a story real quick. I went to a Dell World conference uh, 10, 10 or so years ago, and um, uh, it, was, it was about remote computing, and they brought up uh, one uh, university that talked about uh, using Citrix and talked about the high fidelity uh, solution they built. And then another uh, guy came up right after that and talked about doing it with straight up Microsoft and talked about how successful they were. And I went up, I was like, oh, that's amazing. I want to hear more about how you did that. And I started asking him basic questions like, uh, I don't know, file access. I mean, just really basic copy paste, clipboard mapping, that just basic, basic stuff. And he was, uh, he was caught off guard and he hadn't had taken any of that into consideration. And I was like, man, I bet that project's not going to last very long. You're going to have to find something better. Uh, that straight up Microsoft stack. And again, this was eight, eight ish years ago. Mm -hmm. um, they've come a long way, but there's still plenty of gaps where, you know, you're just around the corner from finding something that's suboptimal. So speaking of which uh, you guys did the uh, what's new and uh, what's new and next with Citrix virtual app and desktops. Uh, Citrix DAS, Citrix uh, D-A-A-S is the all-encompassing when we're talking about the service part of it versus the uh, on-premises part of it. Uh, we got uh, through a lot of it already. This is part three, uh, and I think I know where we're going to start. But uh, as you look back at the previous two conversations, anything you want to add to the things you've covered with us up to this point? Yeah, so I... I'm excited to be kind of rounding out. I think we've had a really good conversation and just showcasing the real questions that we're getting from our customers. So I appreciate how thorough we've been in our previous two conversations. So for anyone who's new, just jumped in on part three. So you're not a little bit lost. We've had different categories of questions that got asked. And I think there's close to 50 or 60 here. So just kind of to lay the groundwork a little bit, I believe we're on the miscellaneous section today, which is, this is kind of the grab bag, rapid fire, quick hit questions that we got that maybe didn't fit in those categories, but are still really important to answer. So it should be fun to put on all of our different hats today and, and discuss maybe questions that come from left field, but maybe questions that have been on our, our listeners' minds and maybe they were too afraid to ask or didn't have the forum to ask them. So this is the grab bag episode today. Yeah, and, and kudos to, for you guys for putting this together and following up with the questions this way. And, and kudos for all of us coming together and, and adding conversational and context to, to what you guys have done here in this blog. So, so let's start here. Um, and quick time check. We got 30 minutes left in the schedule time. I can go longer if, if you guys need to. If not, just somebody you know, flag me and let me know. But uh, the first question is, is the process hierarchy control feature available for Win WIM, um, Windows Endpoint Manager, uh, Workspace Endpoint Manager, sorry, I'm about to screw that up, on-premises? So is the process hierarchy control feature available for WIM on-premises? So WIM is actually Workspace Environment Management. I know we're, we're loving our TLAs today, our three-letter acronyms. <laughs> um, so um, that feature is really something we're, we're growing on top of to optimize your environments. And the process hierarchy control feature has been available on-premises for some time. So I think this is just something that got missed along the way, but WIM is continuing to grow. And I think something we should, we should talk about more often. Mm -hmm. Um, Todd Smith, what is uh, process hierarchy control? Can you just describe that feature real quick? Yeah. Uh, uh, we want to edit this part out. <laughs> no way. <worries. laughs> uh, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to show the value of Zintegra real quick. Bill Sutton, I know you got projects that include this. What is this feature? As I understand it, because it is relatively new, but um, this is essentially allowing um, to control whether certain processes can be started via a parent process. So um, this is about allowing, uh, I believe this is about allowing um, applications to run or processes that are linked to an application that's allowed, whereas the process might not be allowed in and of itself. Uh, so for example, if you've got a, 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 I don't know, if you've got an executable that runs other executables and you grant that executable the right to run as an admin, per, you know, so to speak, um, then if it calls another executable or a sub uh, environment, then it will allow that to run as well. I believe that's the way it works. Okay. I don't know that we've used this yet on any projects. 
Um, we have used the privilege escalation or elevation, which mm -hmm. I know was talked about in an earlier uh, podcast, but uh, this one, I don't know that we've used this one. Yeah. Uh, Jeremy, Monica, any other comments on what this is and why it's important? I mean, it's, I'll tell you what has come up several times, even in the last two weeks. So I'm not going to touch on process hierarchy control in particular, but just WIM as a security platform, right? So um, that's, that's something that's easy to miss. So when we talk to customers about security, right? I mean, we sort of pivot away from Citrix being the all encompassing cert security thing, right? You know, customers think of security in terms of layers and, you know, Citrix is very much different components of Citrix are very much a part of that layer and how you manage executables within a VDA again is, uh, is another layer that is easily missed. Right. So, um, just something to consider, you know, that privilege escalation. So Bill just hit on that is a pretty important point. Um, and then just being able to lock down the VDA, you know, we do it from a few different areas, right? And WIM can be a tool um, within that same arsenal. Uh, and here's the other thing I'll point out as well, because uh, this blew my hair back. So, you know, we've got a team environment and our WIM installation in our team environment with Web Console. So not anything related to this blog post, but um, I'll just say this, like the new WIM out of the mm -hmm. cloud, being web-based is pretty slick, right? So if you haven't had a chance to, to look at and work with it yet, highly recommend you, to Andy's point, you know, let's go talk about it and go turn that on and take a look, um, yeah. you know, if you've got it uh, for sure. And just one thing to be aware of, it's, it's definitely a work in progress. Yeah. So not everything is a part of the web studio right now um, for, for WIM, but things like process control, again, another piece that could be a part of that security arsenal, uh, just being able to cap memory, you know, cap CPU, um, you know, things like that. But, you know, we're transitioning over to it. It's pretty slick, actually. If you haven't had a chance to check it out, I would say go do it. I'm, I'm yeah. glad you went there with the security thing. I was going to ask, is this a performance thing, a security thing, or a management thing? And the truth is, it's probably all yes. of the above. Yes. And, 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 <laughs> D, and all Wim, of the above. <laughs> and WIM as a product is exactly mm -hmm. that. And that is one of those uh, feature sets that um, we are uh, very adamant on if, if you have mm -hmm. this as part of your entitlement, which almost everybody does, if not everybody, uh, and you're not using it, you're missing an opportunity. I mean, Andy, it's so important that we have an optimization pack specifically for Azure Virtual Desktop right now, which is really WEM as a service. And that's all it is. You know, it's that important. All right, let's go, go to the next question here. Uh, we're never getting through it. Uh, is the Citrix <laughs> App Layering Enterprise Layer Manager? So ELM, Enterprise mm -hmm. Layer Manager, integrated into Citrix Studio in Citrix Virtual App and Desktops 2203, which means we're, we're talking about the on-premises, not the service, I believe, Monica? Yeah, so the app layering is deployed and managed separately from Studio, but we've modernized the management experience with a new user interface. So this one was something that was a long time coming. App layering used to run on top of Microsoft Silverlight, and that has since reached end of life, I believe. And so, and I think it only ran on Internet Explorer. And now we took it out of Silverlight and it runs on everything except for Internet Explorer, to my knowledge. So that is much, much cleaner. Um, I like that, Jeremy, in the previous question too, you just brought up new UIs. So this is obviously talking specifically about on-premises, but there has been so much work as of late in I'll, I'll take my hat off and go to the cloud, like within the cloud console, there's so many more streamlined managements for WIM, for um, session recording we're working on. We've got other things on the horizon. There's a new home page in Citrix Studio or Web Studio. So the UI enhancements that we've been making, I don't, I don't know what's in the water here at Citrix, but they've been really, really going off. So not to go on a tangent, but did want to mention that. Sure. I didn't realize that Silverlight went Silverlight went into life in 2021, October last year. Yeah, yeah. a minute okay. ago, yep. Yep, all right. Well, I'm kudos excited. to Citrix for understanding, yes, quality products, but with a good user interface makes it better. Perceived mm -hmm. better, real, realistically better. Uh, companies like Nutanix from day one have, have known that that was, that was paramount. Now, Citrix has a little challenge, right? You guys have a very, very uh, long tail and a legacy product set that's had to evolve, evolve, evolve. Uh, but you know, I think you guys have done a really good job getting from that code base to the modern code base and keeping. Well, you know, and, and Andy, if I can add into here, you know, some of these products, especially uh, the application layering, 
uh, came through a, an acquisition we did of Unidesk. And every time you have an acquisition, they have a different user interface, a different admin interface. And sometimes that's almost a, an afterthought to start integrating those yeah. into a common framework. Um, and I think that's one thing that we've we've done over the past couple of years is try to try to consolidate our style pages for all of our admin consoles so they have the same look and feel and being able to consolidate them down. Um, I think if you remember back in the days, there was probably about a dozen or so different consoles you would have to touch to fully deploy and manage a Citrix environment between the provisioning server consoles, the, uh, the you know presentation server had a different console uh, as well as edge site, right? So you had a you had a variety of different consoles you have to pop back and forth between, and sometimes the data you'd have to replicate some of the data across consoles. So um, this this whole user experience and admin experience uh, in really making it look and feel very similar to each other is, is huge. And, it, and it's one thing to sit there and complain about it and say, well, why don't they just do this, do that? I mean, you're a for-profit company. You don't directly make money out of changing those UIs. It's a long-term play to have mm -hmm. happy users. You can't tie that to an extra dollar to come in next quarter. Yeah. It has to happen. Yeah. All yep. right, um, next one is, uh, does service continuity work with web browsers? So Monica, can you help us with service continuity and uh, then explain the answer to this question? Yeah, so service continuity is really offering that um, availability in case of a, a cloud outage or maybe just a misconfiguration makes a malfunction. So if there's something that makes the cloud go down or makes your environment go down, users can still access their resources. So that is the basis behind service continuity. And it does work from web browsers. So on Chrome and Edge from Windows browsers, it works. And then from Chrome on Mac, I believe you need a Chrome plugin to get it to mm -hmm. work as well. Um, but I know a, a huge amount of users log in from web browsers. So I was excited to see this question because that's a very, very common use case and it does work. Yeah, so the service continuity, the way this piece works is it's connection leases, right? So you've got Workspace app. So not talking about the browsers for a second, but you've got Workspace app, you know, running on your local machine. Um, there's actually a configuration option um, to enable service continuity, you know, out of the cloud. And your Workspace app just starts enumerating those resources. Um, so you've got these connection leases. So if for whatever reason, you know, you lose access to that management plane, you can still connect. But uh, what this does is extend that same functionality to the web browser. So now your web browser with the plugin um, can start caching those same connection leases, which, you know, for a large portion of our, you know, user population, I mean, they're doing it with the browser, right? So uh, this is a pretty big deal. Yeah, that's been a long-term struggle for my, me is to try to help people understand the difference between mm -hmm. using a web browser to get connected through the Workspace app, using the Workspace app to get connected through the Workspace app, or getting connected through the browser and connecting to it via the browser. And um, it's amazing uh, that all that's available. It's also amazing that a number of people that don't really know how to articulate which one they're actually using. That's true. And you know, to go back to what you said earlier around, I think it was Dell World and just that user experience. Um, what's really important to note here is you gotta, you gotta think through this from the perspective of how are your users gonna connect, right? What's that user experience gonna be? And trying to select whether or not you're gonna use Workspace app or you're gonna use the web browser. Yeah. Um, there are there are feature deltas, um, sometimes intentional between the two. Um, but when you think about things like the embedded browser, I mean, that's a workspace app feature. Uh, when you think about like the hosted secure browser, I mean, that's a little bit different, right? So you got to think through that end user experience. Like, what do you got these, what do you got your users doing? Uh, and then you can serve that up. I mean, if you're doing this from a thin client, I mean, Andy, you do a lot with iGel. Um, you know, the one thing that I don't see here is um, the Linux workspace app is not supported for the web browser yet, right? So depending on what browser you have on your iGel thin client, you're going to be using Workspace app if you need to do that, um, if that's supported, right? So again, that's, that's some of the design decisions you have to make from an architect perspective. Well, and, and all that comes down to a consulting opportunity and making sure whatever partner you're working with or Citrix directly yep. that they're advising, first of all, educating you and then advising you on what they think and then getting mm -hmm. your take on, on how, what direction to go. All right, next question here is, uh, is the health check feature the same as the probing feature within Studio? 
And the answer to that is no. I see Todd shaking his head no. Uh, good, good work. No. <laughs> so the answer is no. So the health check feature more runs diagnostics on the health of your studio environment. And the probing feature does session and desktop pre-launching. So it, it simulates that it's going to work before users try to access it. So you can go into more detail. We linked to product docs and the answer, but the answer is they're not the same. Are these features uh, CVAD, Citrix Virtual App and Desktop, or DAS, or both? I believe they are, I believe you can do probing both on-prem. The, the health check feature, I believe, is a cloud feature. I could be wrong, though. Todd, you uh, um, um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I'm not entirely sure. Um, the one thing I was going to ask about this feature, Monica, is there is, I know you're not the product manager for, or the product marketing manager for like analytics, but there's mm -hmm. a new feature in analytics, which will identify black hole VDAs, right? Mm -hmm. And I wonder if this is what's feeding that information in analytics, right? So, you know, again, I don't want to, I don't want to send folks to a VDA that could be the black hole, right? So I'm going to send folks to a VDA and that session is not going to launch for whatever reason. You know, I wonder if the health check feature is feeding that data into analytics. So, you know, it becomes pretty apparent which machines um, are up, they're registered, but they're not accepting connections. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah, I'm not sure how and when they talk to each other, but that would make sense. I'll have to do some more digging on analytics. And I think the probing the probing capabilities is something that, that we've sorely needed for for a while. There was a there was a couple of third party products out there that used to do uh, synthetic uh, transactions, right? So you go and create uh, a couple of uh, recorded transactions that you could actually uh, execute from an endpoint or execute from inside a virtual session, and it would provide you with some some really good diagnostic information that would that would then feed into a health check and really kind of keep you from not only going to the black hole uh vdas but it would also kind of give you uh, some good information on what the user experience may be at a remote location um, and you know we had we had our own internal product edge site for load testing that could do some of that um, but it really comes down to you know, every single Citrix administrator out there keeps getting questioned on what does the user performance really look like, right? We can see the back end and we can see what the what the systems are telling us through diagnostics and analytics, but really uh, understanding what that user transaction is like without having to send someone out there to watch what the user is doing um, and, and engage it that way, right? So being able to have uh, some way to to come up with some synthetic transactions or some probing uh, to really get that information would be extremely helpful. We should probably do a whole podcast just on this topic. I'm, I'm looking at Bill's face while Todd answered that question when he first started. And I'm, I didn't know you guys even had this and I do this for a living. Todd, this is the second time you said edge side too. Something tells me you were a fan. Big fan. You know, we, we got acquired right around the same time. <laughs> Bill, were you aware of the uh, the probing feature as something Citrix had in their stack? I was not. Uh, I've been looking at it while y'all been talking, and uh, I think I I'm absolutely agree with what Monica answered here. They, they are different. I mean, the health check is really more of an overarching check of the entire environment, the various components like storefront servers and BDAs, and and the probing, it looks to me like, is more real-time. Is, is this you know available to me? Um, do I want to send a connection to this VDA or this this um, delivery group, et cetera. So it's, uh, I think one is more a point in time and the other is more um, more you know active all the time. But I was not aware of these features um, uh, and we'll definitely be digging into them very soon yeah, in my yeah, lab. Make sure, our, make sure our team knows that. And this goes back to the conversation just a while ago, just yet another feature that when you lay it on top of what the hyperscalers bring for infrastructure to run all this in and with, uh, now you see the value of, of having a, a partner like Citrix that, um, that understands the entire landscape, not just a bunch of desktops running in the cloud somewhere. Yeah, I'm, I'm fairly certain my team is aware of them, but I'm going to bring them up, bring this up on the next meeting just to make sure. Yeah. So Monica, next question that was asked, with the new hybrid model for subscription slash licensing, I'm not, I need to understand why there's a slash in there. Can on-premises site controllers use the Citrix ITSM adapter for ServiceNow 
near and dear topic to us. We're trying to integrate service now with everything we possibly can. Uh, previously, it was only available for cloud to cloud, as I recall. That's the question. Mm -hmm. So the ITSM service is for Citrix DAS premium only or premium plus. So the higher levels of the cloud additions, it's not applicable to just on premises. But this question reiterates or the answer rather says that if you have an active subscription, high level subscription to Citrix DAS premium in the cloud, your on-prem apps and desktops can leverage the ITSM service if you aggregate your on-premises sites to Citrix Cloud. So Andy, to your point, I know so you're not the only organization that is moving to ITSM or moving the service now, rather. So many are doing that and there's so many actions that you can take in real time um, and that users can do themselves restarting their desktops they can use the virtual agent for that but yeah this is it's a specific cloud feature but if you're in that hybrid mode mode moving to cloud you can also get it to work okay good to know so so in this case i'm using workspace to access my on-prem desktops right and that's how that piece would work because i'm aggregating got it okay mm -hmm. And then where would the uh, ServiceNow piece, could the, the, uh, the support desk then use uh, ServiceNow to get the information they need to go in and support that user? Or, or is this the end user themselves would have the ability to use ServiceNow to support themselves? I think it's both. So the admin can see through ServiceNow and do the help desk through that console. But the virtual agent is what I was getting into in a minute. There's a chat bot where you can pre-configure things that the user can do themselves mm -hmm. so i believe they have to have like a service now account to be able to go in there and do that but they can chat and say i want to restart my virtual desktop and it can auto automatically do that for them via the virtual agent so we're really growing Support our partnership conversation. there oh sorry i think i lost you what was that andy no, I was, gonna, I was saying this is a this is a technology and support conversation. Yes, this is also a business conversation, right? Mm -hmm. What we're finding mm -hmm. is those people that are investing in building out ServiceNow platforms, which we internally are doing right now to support ourselves as well as the host as a managed uh, managed service for ServiceNow. Uh, if you're going to make that level of commitment, and it's a big commitment. You need to find every way possible to get benefit out of the integration. And this is just an example where if you're willing to go hybrid or cloud in the Citrix world, you now can get more value out of that ServiceNow investment. So good to, good to know. I have to bring this up to my team. Mm -hmm. uh, next question, is the gateway callback URL issue with Storefront 2203 going to be addressed with a cumulative update? What is this gateway callback URL issue that's being alluded to here? So there was an issue i'm trying to to remember because i was we linked to a support article so this was fixed with a hot fix and will roll up into the first cumulative update for 2203 i am trying to remember it's been a minute since i've read this on what the issue exactly was i'm sorry you guys but uh it, you guys, jeremy todd bill you guys are familiar with what the callback url issue is um i don't know what the specific issue is um I mean, listen, callbacks in general are usually related to smart access and you know, you've got a call back to the gateway as a part of that process, but um, uh, I'll be honest, I'm a little unfamiliar with this specific issue. It had to do with TLS being disabled, um, TLS 1.0 being disabled um, on the ADC. Um, mm -hmm. There was an issue with the storefront sending it properly or, or being able to establish a secure channel. I don't know all the underlying of it, but it had something to do with TLS 1.0 being disabled on the ADC. Okay. And uh, the, the nice part of this question and answer is the answer was yes. Sorry yes, answer. yes. Exactly. <laughs> yes, period. <laughs> so for some of these, I just kind of wanted to type that and then move on with my life. But you know, yeah. you got to give a little context. Hey, anytime you get a technical guy or gal to say yes and give like a clear, <laughs> succinct answer, you're winning. Right. <laughs> Or, or I could just put, it depends, it, Andy. Yeah, <laughs> I about said, I'm like, I could have written it depends. And, or, you know, it would have been one call that we had to have and be like, it depends. We move on. Yeah. But obviously, that's not the answer we all need. My normal uh, conversational way is to ask leading questions that lead to the second part of the question. And I find that mm -hmm. when I talk to, uh, well, sales guys for one thing and then technical guys for another, I ask the first part of the question and I get a five minute answer and there's no time left for what I was really trying to say. 
All right. Um, next question here. Will there be a VDA option for Mac OS? Man, this thing's been around forever, hasn't it, Todd? Yep. You mean and this question? This, you this question, this question seems here. to come up every year. It's like an anniversary. And then we find the video. There's a YouTube video, I think, of that Synergy session from like 10 years ago where Mark did a demo. Mark Templeton did a demo. And uh, every so often I'll get that question for sure. When are we going to see, you know, being able to remote to a Mac is really what this question is. And I was in that audience, Jeremy, you might've been in that Bill in the audience. Mm -hmm. And I literally said to myself, yeah, but why? <laughs> and is this, just a, is this just a gimmick to see who's interested and what comes next? That's, I mean, kind of the, the answer as well, right? It's that Apple historically didn't said that Mac OS needs to run on Apple hardware. There are some instances in public clouds like AWS, and we know that a lot of people use Mac OS. I'm, I'm operating on a Mac right now, but we support Mac OS obviously via the VDAs. I do my work just fine on my MacBook Pro and we, we welcome new use cases, but it's not in our roadmap right now to virtualize Mac OS. And um, we said, additionally, keep in mind that many apps run on Mac OS will also run on Windows or Linux, which we fully support. So you know, I think we're all kind of sharing the same sentiment. We occasionally run into that marketing department that there is possibly a use case, but at the same time, you're like, guys, you, you bought a $3,000 Mac to run this powerful software for a reason. I'm not really sure you want to virtualize that at scale. This doesn't quite make sense. Yeah, we see correct. it pop up in education every yeah, once in a while. Time. Where well, I say big time. I don't mean big time, Todd, but it does pop and, up. And, yeah. and a lot of the times is because they've they've bought MacBooks in the prior cycle, and now they're looking to move over to Chromebooks, but they still want to run the applications that run natively on Mac. Mm -hmm. And the, the solution that they're looking for is to virtualize the Mac and connect to it from a Chromebook or from, a, from another Edge device. Yeah. To be honest, Todd, I forgot about this ask until COVID started when a lot of uh, universities who had a, um, a Mac OS footprint in like their learning labs, you know, some mm -hmm. of their, their labs, they were looking for a way to remote into it. And so that was a frequent question. I wouldn't say it was a big question, right? So it was, you know, yeah. every so often, um, but I haven't heard much in the last six months, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think there's also point use cases, right? To your point, yeah. Jeremy, there's definitely Mac labs. Um, for example, mm -hmm. in college, I took a digital art class, right? And we would go into the Mac labs for the Adobe suite. But I also know other universities that fully virtualize the Adobe suite via Windows OS, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. I, I think there, there's probably just other ways of getting around it. I think it's an interesting ask, but yeah, not 100% not on our roadmap at this point. And then Adobe solved that by creating it all as a cloud server. In the cloud, yeah. Yep. So guys, the next question, and I'll translate it a little bit because it's near and dear to my business. Is Citrix Workspace app available on iGel OS devices, uh, which iGel is really an OS operating system, Linux operating system. So therefore, we're talking mm -hmm. about the Citrix Workspace app for Linux. And then the iGel OS goes on whatever hardware you want. It could be iGel hardware. It could be any other hardware you want. It could be new hardware, old hardware, whatever meets the minimum requirements. So I'll translate again. Citrix Workspace app for Linux available on iGel OS devices. Uh, how do we know which features these thin clients, again, operating system software, it says just as thin client here, support. I, I spent a lot of time translating in today's world. There's the software aspect of the operating system. And then there's the dumb or thin or thick or powerful, low power, whatever it is, hardware that that thing's running on. Uh, this is really all about Linux. So Monica, um, can you try to help answer this as it relates to iGel, but Linux in general? Yeah. At the most basic level, Andy, to your point, is that the workspace app for Linux is supported on iGel, iGel OS devices. So we have our specific clients that are um, optimized for different OSs. So yeah, the iGel is Linux OS. We You can look to the iGel website or the Citrix Ready website to fully understand what features are included and also just looking at the Workspace app for Linux documentation. It's the Workspace. So that's, that's the great thing about Linux-based OSs is that we have that one client that works across. But iGel, I 
also hear of a lot here in Citrix land and we do a lot with them in Citrix ready. So I think the vast majority of features that we introduce that are capable on Linux come to iGel. But have you seen it any differently, Andy? Um, well, no, that's anything that's to add. That's that's exactly right. And it's intentional. Mm -hmm. iGel uses the native Citrix workspace app for Linux. They don't customize mm -hmm. it. They don't they don't make changes to it in such a way that's hard to support. And they actually embed in their layering technologies three versions of your uh, mm -hmm. Linux workspace app so that if you need to roll forward, roll back, whatever you're chasing to try to solve, uh, it's just a, a matter of toggling it within, within the profiles locally or in the uh, universal management server. Uh, that was the moment when I was like, uh, yeah, this is the thin client operating system I'm going to market with. Yeah, that's pretty unique in the thin client space, isn't it? Like most of the other thin client vendors will bake in a version into a version of their their, their, their firmware. Like it, which I think is, that was a... I think that was a gimmick yep. and a ploy back in the day. It was kind of lock in. Uh, and I think mm -hmm. it was also had a lot to do with you guys uh, at Citrix not um, not keeping up with feature parity. Now that you've done that and committed to it for the past five years, uh, there's mm -hmm. really no need. There's really no need to go out and make your own unless you're just trying to create some type of uh, vendor lock in, which I see a ton. And it's usually when the customer realizes that they've been locked in by a vendor, that's when they decide it's time to make a change. Yeah. Okay, um, love those last two topics. Uh, uh, next one is, uh, do we have a function to recover persistent desktops if they have lost domain membership or network details? Uh, Monica, try to answer that from a Citrix perspective and then the rest of us can jump in on how you might do that from a, just a overall IT uh, methodology perspective. Right, I think the answer is IT in general, as we put, there's no specific recommendation here aside from using your local admin credentials to log in and rejoin the domain. So Citrix provisioning has an has an out of band method to reset machine passwords and you can use scripting and or third party solutions. Mm -hmm. So Bill, if you were advising a customer, if they had um, if they had persistent desktops and what are, what are a couple of things you would tell them to make sure they right. were protecting themselves? Well, if, if you were using provisioning to Monica's point, although I don't know why you would use provisioning for a persistent desktop, though I have actually seen customers do that Believe it or not, big university I know of did it um, back in the day. And anyways, uh, you could leverage the, the tool that's in the provisioning server console where you can reset the, the domain membership or reset the, net, the computer account in AD. Uh, as far as on a, a non-provisioned machine with uh, um, that's persistent, I, I, it's just standard IT tools. Just like if you had a desktop that lost its domain membership, I'd basically yeah. just go through and rejoin it or use a script or there's also some um, some some uh, command line utilities you can use to try to reset the machine account so there's lots of ways you can you can attack this but it becomes a troubleshooting exercise largely I mean Bill you hit the nail on the head right so I mean a, a, a persistent desktop is like just a physical desktop right what tool do you use there you're probably going to do the same thing if it was a virtual right. desktop right yeah the only, the only difference is in the virtual world you, know, you have snapshots and things where it's in a nice safe place in the data center and ideally you're running it on some type of shared storage or some type of hyper converge where mm -hmm. you know the redundancy is infinitely more than it is with that person running around or uh, with a laptop or a desktop locally uh, you know if you say hey andy i need my desktop back to exactly how it was three weeks ago i'm like okay here hold my beer i'll go make that happen yeah, so we would see this in the past with customers that didn't have any snapshot of capabilities, right? So they would build a persistent, and we see it more on the server side than on the desktop side. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I'd love to jump in that deeper, but uh, just talk to your consulting partner, talk to Citrix, talk to your IT staff, and this, that, this is a super simple problem to solve these days. Mm-hmm. Uh, next question is, is the support for the Linux VDA on par with the Windows VDA? Wow, that sounds like a familiar topic. <laughs> yeah, I'm having deja vu right now. Um, the answer to this is yes. Um, we mentioned that support for the Linux VDA is on par with Windows. So at a support level, Citrix across the board, you can you can bring your issues into support, but then also wanted to mention here that obviously they are two different OSs, so there's two different work streams within Citrix on the Linux VDA versus Windows, but we 
we wrote that we are always working to create feature parity between the two OSs. So this is the conversation that we were just having with the workspace app for Linux, but talking about the Linux VDA as well. And I work closely with both the workspace app team and the Linux VDA team. And yeah, just over the, the four years that I've been here, they've been really on the ball. So obviously there are some, some gaps and some things that Windows can do that Linux can't just by nature, but we're always working to, to keep in lockstep with one another. So the things that you can control are going to be, uh, if they're not there immediately, they're there in a short order. Yep. Yeah. And that's huge. Uh, I was, man, I was with some, I was with a guy from the UK and a guy from Germany, literally uh, midnight last night, hanging out at a bar and, and they were pretty much asking me why in the world would anybody run a thin client operating system, IGEL specifically, especially the German guy, uh, when you have to run Windows on the endpoint and middle, why not just run Windows everywhere? And uh, I think I convinced them, but I was like, man, if you haven't asked me that question, obviously you don't manage Windows on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. and, and understand the attack vector too. I mean, I, I love Windows. Don't get me wrong. It's I, my career wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Microsoft Windows at the same point. If I don't need it on the endpoint, I sure as heck don't want to have it out there. Yep. I mean, a, a common security conversation is what's your attack surface, right? And yeah. that's the whole point. Yep. So guys, we're at the last question. I think it's an interesting one to finish on. And I, I think it's going to be a, and it depends kind of thing and, and limitless. But uh, Monica, the last one is where can I get more content and training on the latest features? Yeah. Go ahead. Everywhere. No. Everywhere. <laughs> Everywhere, all at once. Um, so we mentioned a few things here, and I hope you caught that, you know, us marketers put this really pretty shiny question at the end, just by by nature of how beautifully it worked out. It was totally coincidental. But we mentioned a few things here that, you know, the listeners may not be as familiar with, or hopefully you are. Citrix Tech, Tech Zone is what we started off this answer with, and that's a great place to find architectures, use cases. They've The technical marketing team has really built out that area to help you answer pretty specific questions about different features and capabilities. Also, if you're a CSS entitled customer success services, you have access to Citrix education. And then lastly, the, the Citrix blog. Uh, that's what we're chatting through right now, reading off of. And then places like this podcast maybe yeah. are a great place to go as well. So if you're looking for information, there's probably somewhere to find it, but those are some consolidated areas. Well, and that's the key term. If you're looking, there's plenty. I mean, kudos to Citrix and kind of leading the way in the industry, limitless amount of opportunity to go learn and read about this stuff. Uh, if you're looking, a lot of people just aren't looking or it's like one of the reasons why we started this uh, podcast. Mm -hmm. I, I and Bill, then you guys, I bet Jeremy and Todd, you'd just don't have enough time to consume it all. This is a kind of a, a cheat sheet, shortcut, fast way to get some of it in. Yeah, no, this is great. And I would argue most customers don't realize they have some kind of access to training.citrix.com. So the Citrix education piece, so if you're paying, if you've got active maintenance on any product, whether it's on-prem in the cloud, doesn't matter. You've got access to the website, you log in and you've got some level of access to that to that site and there's learning videos, how things work. It's very structured, right? What product you use and what are you trying to do? Boom, there you go. So it's a great place to start. Um, and depending on your level of access, you might even have some labs available to you. So the way to just get hands on. So I'd be curious from uh, Jeremy and Todd's perspective, I meet new, really intelligent people all the time that are like, just tell me what I need to know about Citrix. I'm like, oh my gosh, where do I start? <laughs> At the same time, I'm excited that they, uh, they want to know um, but I feel like I need to go back to 1999 and start there. Um, mm -hmm. but that's not reality. It's so true. And, you know, Citrix touches so many things as well that, you know, some of our, some of our configuration ends up, issues end up being, you know, how do you manage windows in a virtual environment, right? You know, how do you manage the GPOs? How do you lock down a desktop? You know, some of the policies it's when you say you want to know everything you need to know, I'll go, well, what do you know? Let's start there. <laughs> Well, and as you said, you talk about the using provisioning services, enabling the, yeah. uh, the account password reset for the machine account a while ago. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, I hope somebody told them to turn off automatic machine password changes within Active Directory first. Right. But I'm yep. like, oh, do I have time to stop and explain what that is and then get a blank look at, okay, what is that? Okay, let me back up and explain what that mm -hmm. is. Uh, a lot of it's uh, the, the windows and the infrastructure pieces that are under the Citrix is, uh, you know, that's a massive amount of education to begin with. 
Listen, Andy, you said something many years ago that has always stuck with me. And it was back when we introduced MCS, right? And so customers would go, hey, listen, I'm a provisioning server. I'm trying to decide between MCS and provisioning server. And the first question you asked was not, well, you know, how comfortable are you with either technology? It, it was who owns the network and what's your relationship with that person? Because, you know, PVS provisioning, Citrix provisioning runs across the network. And if you have very little insight and access, I mean, that's a, that's something that's going to be difficult for you to troubleshoot, right? So, you know, there's so many parts and pieces that touch and, you know, where you sit, I mean, it, Monica, it's a, it depends, right? It's always, it depends. always, it depends. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll tell that story real quick. We had a uh, awesome provisioning services to physical and virtual desktop deployment. I was so proud of this thing. Came in on a Monday morning. It didn't work anymore. Turns out the uh, network team had changed the DHCP uh, provider. They went from using Windows to using a third party. That third party during the shutdown process had a flag in the registry to release the uh, DHCP address, which in a provisioning server world, that's like ripping the hard drive uh, out 75% yep. of the way through the shutdown. And it took two weeks for us to go find that problem and prove that they did it. But I knew it had to be them because they're the only thing that changed over the weekend. Never the network. Yeah. Well, provisioning yes. server used to be the, uh, the way to find all kinds of problems on your network. You could identify any other service that was running Pixie or any other, like you said, DHCP issues or DNS issues could all be, uh, could all be identified by, by turning on PBS. Yeah even just general network errors we i had one just i'll tell quickly uh we i built the environment in probably a day and a half and everything was going swimmingly and next day i came in and had like seventy five thousand retries or something on the on the uh, e-disc and turned out after a lot of investigation and bringing in network resources that somebody sometime in the past had installed a had run a cable from the core and basically created a network loop they've been running with this network loop for years and never knew it yeah. I had no idea. Yep. Yeah. Hey guys, I'm late for my next call. This has been awesome. This has been a great uh, three part series. Monica, thank you very much. And Todd and Jeremy, thank you for joining. And, and Bill, always, always good to have your insight. Thanks, yep. Andy. Yep. Thanks, Thanks Andy. for having Talk me. Talk to you guys later. Talk yeah. to you right. soon. We'll do it again. Thanks. All right.